HVB here, and I want to talk about the multiple pass approach to tank busting with bombs falling out of these Axis aircraft. And when I say multiple pass, I mean instead of making one run and hauling ass out of there, you intend to hang around over the target area and make a multiple pass attack dives trying to maximize the killing potential of all that ordnance you're carrying. Assuming you're rolling with adequate fighter escort to neutralize the enemy fighter threat and the target area flak is either eliminated or you have a plan and the numbers to eliminate that flak, let's talk about getting down to business. Used to be that a tank in multiplayer existed in four states. Alive, smoking and under a countdown to explode, on fire, or a blackened out dead hulk. The tank damage model upgrade that came out a while back has injected more realism into the picture with damage tracks and stuff, and the changes made it much harder to know from visual inspection whether a tank is destroyed. Let's play a game I call Dead or Not, not dead. dead. I'm going to show you some multiplayer video footage of tanks with their icons turned off, and you guess whether they're dead or alive. Then I'll turn on the icons and we'll find out. First tank is a T-34. Looks like it's got both tracks damaged and it's smoking a little bit. Your guess? Correct answer, dead. Next tank is a KB-1, one broken track, no other apparent damage. Your guess, correct answer, alive. Next tank is another T-34, smoking pretty bad, no other apparent damage. Your guess, correct answer, dead. Another T-34, right in front of that one that's smoking, no apparent damage. Your guess, correct answer, dead. BT-7, missing a track, damaged rear road wheels on one side, smoking pretty bad. Your guess? Correct answer? Alive. Another BT-7, exact same damage. Your guess? Correct answer? Alive. Another T-34 in front of a smoking T-34 and KV-1, no apparent damage. Your guess? Correct answer? Dead. And the last tank, actually tanks. Two T-34s, no apparent damage on either one. Your guess? Correct answer, dead. So the takeaway from this little game is it's not so easy to know a tank's damage status from visual inspection. And because of that, you can run into frustration and disappointment when you attack a group of tanks that's already been worked over by somebody else and there's a combination of dead and alive tanks side by side down there. Now I'm gonna give you some tips to help you mitigate this problem. And the first one is, Check your name on the lobby screen after you make a bomb pass. If you kill the tank, it will show up there. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to register and you may have to check back with it a few times as you're extending out, turning around, and lining up to make that next pass. If your aircraft has a rear gunner, you can quickly jump into the rear gunner position to check how your bomb did. If you're in a large group of people buzzing around the target area, however, you need to hop in and out of there fast so you can keep your eyes to the front and the sides to avoid collisions. And I'll talk more about that a little later. The T-70 and BT-7 are the easiest tanks to kill with bomb, and I would say the T-70 is slightly more difficult to kill because of its very small size. Now these kill range circles by bomb type are not based on anything scientific, just my personal observations. The T-34 medium tank is much harder to kill, and regardless of bomb size, you're going to have to put it down pretty close to the T-34 to kill it. And my impression is that the KV-1, although when you're trying to kill it with a cannon, it soaks up a lot of rounds, it's not that much different from a T-34 as far as bomb proximity needed to get a kill. And before we move on, I want to talk about a couple of new tanks I haven't seen much in multiplayer yet, but I have played around with them offline in some custom missions, and it looks to me like this SG-122 is about as hard to kill as a T-34 with bombs. And it looks to me like the M4A2 A3 Sherman holds up about the same as a Russian light tank in terms of bomb effectiveness against it. Now, tank's not like an aircraft hangar or a building. It's a very small target and much more resilient against bombs than the typical soft targets. Pinpoint bombing precision is required, and if you don't put those bombs in close, you're going to walk away with nothing. And unlike large target areas where a good bomb run might get you 20 plus ground kills, and even a shitty run will get you 7 or 8, you might land with no kills if you miss with all your bombs against tanks. Now there are a handful of tried and true techniques out there that work and before we get to aircraft specifics I'm going to tell you in general terms how I do it and then I'm going to tell you how a very skilled buddy of mine does it. Now there's no mystery to my technique. I conjure up a few practice missions in the mission editor and then I take that aircraft out and practice dropping bombs on tanks in different terrain and weather a few hundred times or however long it takes until I know the right time to hit the bomb release button regardless of aircraft speed, dive angle, or altitude. 
I record every practice mission if I can't see the bomb impacts in real time. And I watch them after each practice mission to see what works and what doesn't. Then I'll take that technique into a multiplayer environment and try it out. And you will run into all kinds of shit online you won't see in a controlled practice mission. And between those two environments, I'll continue to work out the bugs until it works fairly consistently. Now, let me tell you about a guy I enjoy flying with who is a highly skilled tank killer, SCG Limbo. Limbo uses a custom fixed view map to one of his joystick buttons, and if you don't know how to set a fixed view, Requiem has a very detailed explanatory video on how to do that. And I hope you're looking at a clickable card at the top of the screen right now that will take you to that video, but regardless, the link to his video is in the description section below. Now Limbo's custom fixed view is zoomed in almost all the way, and in this photo he's just a tad right of the tank instead of being perfectly centered on it, but as soon as that tank goes past the yellow glass, he hits the drop button and gets a kill with an SC-2 50 bomb about 95% of the time in the JU-88. And you can also check out his video here where he explains the technique in a BF-110. So that way definitely works, and you can customize the fixed view to suit all your preferences on all the aircraft you fly. And if you're wondering why I don't use it, well, mostly because I had learned this shit the hard way already before I found out you could do that. But the other reason is because of all the potentials in aircraft speed, dive angle, and bomb release altitude. You may have heard the old advice to drop the bomb when the target disappears under the aircraft nose. Well, that only works within a certain speed range, dive angle, and bomb release altitude, and so does the fixed view. You have to have a confluence zone of these three factors to make it work. When you practice a lot with variations in those factors, and believe me, you will find yourself facing those variations in multiplayer whether you want to or not, for numerous situational reasons, you'll have a better chance of putting that bomb down accurately. And before we get to the 110, I want to tell you that every aircraft is a little bit different concerning what you're looking at at the point where you should hit the bomb release button. In fact, different loadouts in the same aircraft can change that sight picture. For example, the bomb release point that works for this loadout in the BF-110 will not work for this loadout. Your bombs will end up short of the target. Now the BF-110 is my go-to Axis aircraft for multi-pass tank busting, and this is my go-to loadout for both BF-110 models. If you've seen my previous videos of JU-88 smoking tanks and single-pass attacks the past three years, you might be surprised that I prefer the 110 for multi-pass attacks. And true enough, the 88 carries a much larger bomb load, as we'll see in a little bit. It just comes down to the fact that I've spent a lot more time practicing this particular technique in the 110, and I was kind of getting tired of flying the 88 all the time. In the 110, I try to arrive at the target area at an altitude of about 700 meters. I have the engine ATA at 1.2 and I move the nose trim to very, very tail heavy, sometimes all the way back. This is because I like to come in low and close because the closer I am, the more accuracy I can get. However, you have to be able to pull out of that attack dive when you're getting that close to the ground, and a light nose is critical when the dive is steep. But the usual ballpark dive angle looks something like this. And even when I don't need all that dive recovery trim, I know it's there and it doesn't affect the nose behavior too much. Much during the attack dive. And by the way, there is a significant speed difference between the E2 and G2, but honestly, I really don't have to make many adjustments to the technique when switching between them. Coming off the first run, I egress out with a climb angle that looks like this and start turning around when I hit about 400 meters of altitude. Now that can vary depending on the ground elevation relative to sea level, but generally it's around 400 meters. I continue to climb slightly while turning with the goal of starting the next dive from an altitude somewhere between 600 and 800 meters. Now I may speed up that turnaround depending on how much time I have over the target area. Maybe the fighter escorts are getting low on fuel, or I may extend out the egress off the target because there are several friendly aircraft swarming the target area and I don't want to run into anybody, and I'll talk more about that a little later. I like to use a one second bomb delay with the 110 for the simple reason that if the bomb happens to bounce, it won't move too far away from the tank before it explodes. Now German bombs arm pretty quick compared to Russian bombs, but there is a point where it won't arm if you drop from an altitude that's too low. It takes some practice to develop a feel for how low you can drop without crossing that barrier. You can circumvent that arming issue by changing to a 5 second delay, and it will explode most of the time regardless of drop altitude. Just be aware that if the bomb does bounce, it can go a long way in 5 seconds. In case you're wondering, when I drop SC-500s with a 1 second delay, the bomb detonation shakes the aircraft a little, but I have yet to experience aircraft or pilot damage because I'm normally egressing out of there at a speed of around 450 to 500 kilometers per hour. Now when I'm dropping the belly SC-500s when there's no wind, I put the sight reticle vertical stadium line right down the middle of the tank. For the SC-50s on the wings, you have to offset in the opposite direction by about this much, but the point where you release the bomb is the same as the belly SC-500s, and you may be surprised how close you can put those SC-50s down with a little practice. Now when dropped as singles, the bombs are released in this order. 
Another way to look at it is the underbelly bombs drop in this order and the wing bombs in this order. And I'm telling you this because you might want to go back and forth between the belly bombs and the wing bombs. And the reason you might want to do that is to take advantage of the offset opportunities. For example, you might see a tank just off to the left or right of a tree and you don't want to risk clipping a wing on that tree by coming in too low. You can offset to the opposite side if your next wing bomb is set to release on the tree side. And if the tanks are showing offsets opposite of what you need for that next wing bomb, just fly to the other side, turn around, and you're all set. Now when people are thinking about busting tanks in a Stuka, they're thinking about the BK-37 cannons, but you can smoke a few tanks with the bombs as well. If you go out with the one SC-500 under the belly and two SC-250s on the wings, you can get three tanks, and the bomb drop order is right here. I arrive at the target area in the Stuka at around 7 to 800 meters altitude, set the engine to a tad under 1.25 ATA and 2350 to 2400 RPMs, but you can dial that back a little if you want to go in slower. Since the JU-87 is pretty slow in the attack dive, I usually come in a little steeper than I would in a 110, it just seems to be more accurate like that. I do input some tail heavy trim to ensure a clean dive recovery. I don't crank it all the way back, but about halfway between default and full tail heavy. Interestingly enough, I have found that you don't have to offset with the wing bombs. They seem to converge toward the center for some reason. I also use a 5 second bomb delay with the JU-87 because it doesn't egress off the target fast enough for a 1 second bomb delay. Once you get the feel for dropping accurately with the Stuka, you can take the SC-500 belly bomb and 4 SD-70s under the wings, and their release order is here. This loadout gives you the potential to take out up to 5 tanks. The SD-70s appear to be maybe a tad stronger than the SC-50s, but you still have to get them very close to get a kill. And we'll close out here with a look at some of these runs with the SD-70s. Now there's a virtual buffet of bomb loadout possibilities for multi-pass tank busting in the JU-88. You can take all big bombs, all little bombs, or a combination of big bombs and little bombs. While dropping the big bombs are a pretty straightforward affair, you have many drop options for how to drop the SC-50s. Taking 44 SC-50s gives you 28 in the internal bomb bay and 16 on the wings. While you can drop the internal bombs as singles or groups of 2, 4, 8, or drop all, the wing bombs drop 4 at a time, so selecting the underwing single option will put out 4, underwing pair puts out 8, and drop all, all 16. And dropping four SC-50s into one spot works okay. It's kind of like carrying four 200 kilogram bombs externally, but I think you probably get better results with four or six SC-250s. There are also several possibilities for bomb drop order for augmented bomb loadouts. I drop all the external heavy bombs first, and if I brought SC-50s in the belly, I drop those afterward. How you drop the SC-50s depends on your skill, target area layout, and how much time and fuel you have. For example, when the column's on a road, you can drop them in groups of four lengthways down the road and have a good chance of getting one in close to the side of the tank. But you can drop eight, or if you're really good, you can drop singles or pairs, or if you're running out of time or fuel, you can just dump them all in one pass. Now my way of doing it in the 88 is to arrive at the target area at around 1,000 meters altitude and pull the nose trim all the way back to tail heavy. I usually cut the engines for a little bit at the beginning until I get the aircraft speed down to around 300 kilometers per hour. Because with that much tail heavy trim, the nose will fight to pull up on you if you exceed 500 kilometers per hour in the attack dive. Now like I said, Limbo has this technique down to a science.
science using a set view, but I'm just eyeballing it. I have to drop higher than I do in the 110 because the 88 is not as responsive for making a quick dive recovery. I use a one second bomb delay with the 88 and after bomb release I try to get back up to 800 to 1000 meters during my egress climb out and turnaround. Now here's the bomb release order for loadout options. If you're using the 6SC250 external loadout, you're going to have to offset those two wing bombs just like you do with the BF110 wing bombs. If you forget what order bomb you're on, just check the yellow lights down in the bombardier compartment and when it's down to two, you know all you have left are the two wing bombs. I don't fly the 111 much except for the occasional resupply or level bombing mission and I don't bust tanks with it, but I know somebody who does and who totally kicks ass at it. About a year ago I saw this video of Fly Us 747 tearing up tanks in the wings server and I was impressed because I tried to get something going in the tank killing department with the 111 and I just couldn't do shit with it. Then recently we happened to be over the same enemy tanks at the same time in TAW and I got to watch this guy up close and personal shred a whole bunch of tanks in the 111 dropping S. C two fifties in groups of two. So I messed around with it a little bit offline and kind of understand how he's doing it and maybe one of these days I'll put some serious time into getting this down. But the takeaway here is that it can be done in the Heinkel 111 and done very effectively and the loadout possibilities are pretty impressive especially with the H16 model. When attacking columns, I've noticed most ground attackers tend to favor either the side-to-side -side attack or they like to attack along the road. Truth is, you need to be able to do both because when the column is going through a stretch of woods, side-to-side -side can be problematic because of the forest on both sides of the road. And damn near every road on the Kuban map has bunched up trees on both sides. Side-to-side -side attacks are possible but much more difficult and dangerous because you have to steepen your dive considerably. And the steeper the dive, the higher you're going to have to drop to ensure successful dive recovery. Another problem you'll encounter going side-to-side -side is individual tanks conveniently protected by trees. One solution we already covered for this is using wing bomb offsets to get around obstacles on either side of the tank. But when the tank is positioned directly in front of a tree, it's a dicey proposition using offsets. Now I'm not going to lie, I have pulled some dumb stunts sometimes like coming in low in these situations of barely getting away with it, but I don't recommend it. On the other hand, sometimes you run into problems bombing down the road because the trees are overhanging the road and blocking your bombs. Or there may be a wind issue and we'll discuss that in a minute. But usually if you face an obstacle using one attack direction, you can beat it by switching to the other. If you don't want to switch directions, the only alternative solution is to drop higher to ensure you will clear the obstacle when pulling out of the dive. Just remember, the higher you drop, the more difficult it is to be accurate and a bigger bomb will enhance your chances of success. If you saw my video on single pass tank busting, you know how wind can do a number on your attack run. And it's no different in multi-pass attacks. It blows your aircraft, blows your bombs, it just blows. Now wind speeds 2 meters per second or less probably won't exert much effect on your runs, but anything higher than 2 meters and the closer it is to a 90 degree angle relative to your attack dive, it's going to play hell on your accuracy. Now I've put in several hours studying how to get the perfect wind offset on these single pass JU-88 runs based on a given wind speed and angle but I'm not a big fan of trying to figure out the correct offset for multiple pass attacks because there are just too many variables involved when you may be coming in from slightly different directions on every pass. If I'm attacking tanks deployed off-road like this and the winds are high, I check the wind direction and try to make my attack dives into the wind and with the wind to my back. If the tanks are in a column, I'm hoping the wind is either blowing along the road or against the road and attack with the wind to the front and back. If it's like 20 or 30 degrees off, I try to offset a little against the wind, but when you already have to figure offsets for the wing bombs, it really starts to be a pain in the ass. If the wind's blowing 45 degrees off both potential attack directions, you're pretty much fucked and you're just going to have to offset the best you can. When a group of ground attackers show up at the tanks loaded up for bear and ready to go, it's like a pack of piranhas and everybody wants to get down there immediately and start the killing. And folks get that killing fixation going on and start to pay less attention to the people around them. And that presents the risk of collisions and getting blown up by each other's bombs. 
And as the number of remaining tanks decreases and several people start lining up on that same tank, that risk increases exponentially. Now accidents happen. It's happened to me more than once and I've done it to other people a few times, but there are steps you can take to cut down the frequency of those accidents. Now if there's only two of you on a column, one guy can start at the back and the other guy at the front, and if you have a third pilot, you can put him in the middle. But more than that, and you can see how things start to get complicated. And when you're hitting a group of tanks crammed into a small area like this, there's a big potential for ugliness. I suppose you could all come in a long trail formation with a several hundred meters separation between aircraft, but you probably have to practice that for a while as a group in a co-op mission or an empty server to get that down. Now, normally a flight leader will tell the group to adhere to a left or right turn pattern when coming off the target and turning around for the next pass. The problem with that is if you come off the target in a straight line and then make a left or right turn, you're going to be now facing a different section of the column. And if you missed and you want to hit the same tank again, you're no longer flying a straight line heading perpendicular to the column, you're at an angle. To fix this, the flight leader can say angle right, turn left, or angle left, turn right and that will give you a modified figure eight pattern to put you back in front of the same area. And if you kill that last tank, you can scoot a little over to the right or left to hit the next one. Communication is also key, and how much info you should communicate depends on how many people are hitting the column, the experience level of your group, and how many people are trying to talk at the same time in your channel. I make an effort to at least communicate when I'm starting the attack dive, the direction I'm coming from, and when I drop the bomb. When everybody else does that, the group has a better idea of knowing where everybody is. Now there may be other groups over the target area or lone wolves and you don't have any combo with them at all. That's why I minimize the use of the zoom function when I dive because I want as much peripheral vision as possible to watch the other folks. And I'm popping in and out of the lobby screen to keep track of tank kills but I'm doing it very quickly. When there's a large group attacking I don't even check behind me after I drop a bomb. Generally, I will attack one tank until it's dead, because if you're diving in and out of the target area haphazardly bombing whatever you find in front of you, you may just damage a bunch of tanks without killing them. And to stay on the same tank, you need to find some kind of landmark you can easily locate when you turn around and remember the tank's location in proximity to that landmark. It can be a bomb crater, smoking tanks, an easily recognizable group of trees, an intersection town, just something you can locate quickly and orient to your targeted tank. Well, that's about it. Make sure you check out the description section below for Fly S747 Limbo's YouTube videos along with Requiem's video on custom camera options. I got more handbook videos in the pipeline, so please hit subscribe to stay current. Thanks for watching. This is HVB. Peace out.